My mother was very resourceful. There are people with common sense, and she had a lot of that too, but she also had uncommon sense. And that's the part of her that I especially loved. In the house where I grew up in Ann Arbor, there were some holes on the roof over our sun porch. Nothing leaked, but you could see them, and they didn't look beautiful. And the common sense thing to do would be to call a roofer to come in and fix them. But my mother said, why don't you go out on the roof and turn them into something? We had a flowered roof, and each place where I had a flower was a place where there was a hole in the roof. And no one saw these holes because we had now changed all that. My name is Shoe Fly Sally, sir. I've traveled far and wide. My name is Nancy Willard, and I am a writer who makes things with her hands. I write poetry, fiction, and children's books. And many of the things that I, I make, the three-dimensional things that I make, I make in connection with some of the, with the children's books because they help me to imagine more clearly something that is, that is fantastic. The moon and Riddle's diner, it's half a smile away. The snow and reindeer gather with the emerald antelopes play. Their saxophones by starlight, they clap for the hooting moon. When the Grokabees choose to drop their shoes in the lap of the silver spoon, you'll hear the teapot crooning in a voice like the morning fog, the ballad of the riddling ghost and the brave Chuggamonga frog. The specialty on starry nights is sweet tornado brew. He comes with wood chip chili chips and sneaky sneaker stew. Well, I was raised in Ann Arbor, Michigan. My father was a scientist, he was a chemist. And my mother had done some writing. In my memory, my mother's reading. She's a great reader. And she read aloud a lot to my sister and me. And um, I think that probably had a lot to do with, with certainly with my love of books, because she so clearly loved books and loved literature. If I, were, if I were in the middle of making a project, I wouldn't have to take it down, even when company was coming. Um, I could keep it up, and if she would just, that would be a separate area. I do remember once when some people were coming to the house unexpectedly, and uh, they called the people we hadn't seen for a while, and I said, Mom, we don't have time to sweep or clean up. What will we do? And my mother said, We'll turn the lights low. Nancy Willard is a really important name in children's books, not just by virtue of the fact that she's won the most prestigious award for children's writing, which is the Newbery Award, but because she is a writer of great influence. And a lot of the things that she has done, especially with poetry in the last 20 years, has had a great effect on children's literature as we know it today. Nancy Willard is an enormously influential writer, not just for the kinds of books that she writes, but for the teaching that she brings to writers, both at the Breadloaf Writers Conference and her books about writing. Feathered Forest, and he's also in the Magic Cornfield. It was exciting going to the airport with a horse and a, and a cat carrier. <laughs> because first I went through the X-ray machine, and people thought, oh, she's X-raying her cat, how awful. <laughs> Said another word to me all the rest of it. <laughs> but I always 
always tell children how to make them, and so when I talk to them, it's a wire foundation, a lot of unmatching Barbie doll shoes. And why has it got eight legs, his horse? I ask children that. And then I tell them, my reason is that the first time I got on a horse, I thought this must have more than eight legs, so all these motions, and it was such a big animal. Well, this is where I live, so please come in. And you probably wonder who some of these characters are. When I was doing Cracked Corn and Snow Ice Cream and the Magic Cornfield, I had corn on my mind, so I made some of these creatures because I like the graphics on the cans. You know, once you make one, you make another, and you want to see what else you can do. They're related somehow. It's a family story. I think some of the most wonderful objects that you can work on come from the, the sea, come walking from the beach. These are seahorses. They look like acrobats, but it's a sort of celestial circus. And the figure here is a, it's a seahorse poet. And he's reading a book, and he's writing, and he's singing of his poems, and he's being sort of watched over by various animals to make sure that everything goes well. And the umbrella, I always imagine is an umbrella with dreams, you put it over you and things fall into your head, neat ideas, so it's a magic umbrella. The, the tree itself was in the backyard for many, many years. It was hollow. As long as it was a little bit of it, it was alive, we kept it there, but the last year it died, the tree had to come down. But when I saw a hollow tree, I thought, what a wonderful thing you could do with that. And then I thought I would use it like a little theater. This tree was waiting to become some kind of a theater. I've dined at the Wooly Bully and the Flying Fish Cafe. At the Ruby Owl, I started to howl when they thought I couldn't pay. I got thrown out of the chocolate trout for teaching the clams to bite. But I love the fiddles at the Moon and Riddles, where they let me dance all night. We're going into the room where the creatures live. And here they are. I sometimes use them as inspiration. Because when you're writing fantasy or something that is fantastic, it sometimes helps to make it. You understand the character with your hands in a different way than you do with your head. When I was doing William Blake's Inn, I had some help with the carpentry on the inn. I had made it in cardboard, and a friend of ours who's a good carpenter made it of shell and wood, which I then furnished and decorated and put the creatures in it. And Alice and Martin Provenson, who did the pictures for William Blake's Inn, and they had seen the inn, but I told them, don't pay any attention to the way I've made it. You have to do it your own way. I have the green rabbit, he's the, the porter. What's fun when I show this to children is to ask them where they think I got the whiskers, because I tried many things. First I tried string, that didn't work. Fish bones, no, the cat liked those too well. <laughs> and then I finally found whiskers. In fact, sh cats do shed their whiskers. And everybody I knew had cats, I had them saving cat whiskers for me until I had enough. So he has real cat whiskers, but I'd, no animal was harmed in the making of that rabbit. This is actually made of ceramic. It's a planter. And I think I once had a plant in it, but I thought, well, this is really more. <laughs> Again, I, you know, she should have a life, another life. And what is she thinking, this cloud? I saw it as a cloud, probably because I've always wanted to meet a cloud that I could talk to that was thinking thoughts. Well, the next best thing is to go make one. Because, you know, when I was little, I'd look at the sky and I'd see the, I could see, we could all do that. Figures in the clouds that look like animals, they look like people, they look like carriages. 
So the next best thing to be able to talk to one of those directly is to make one. So this is the cloud lady, and I can see what's in her mind. This had a funny history. This was a spoon that was in our spoon door when I was a little girl, and it never behaved itself. It was always getting caught. Other spoons got stuck on it. It was bent. And finally, it was given to me to do something with it, to make it behave or be what it should be. And I kept that thing for years, thinking, I'll find the right thing to do with it. And then when I was watching the Olympics, I saw the skaters and the arch of their backs. And I thought, oh, that's like that spoon. So I went and got the spoon, and then I knew what it wanted to be. It wanted to be a skater. That whole character started with the, the bag. I thought, I could do something with this. And I love ragdolls. I had a lot of them as a child. He and the other one, Totem and Bottom, they really became the main characters for the Magic Cornfield. The whole book is the correspondence that this person sends to that person. He's trying to get to Minneapolis and all of the magical places and act that he accidentally gets to before he gets there. I see a lot of them as travelers. It's often the way a story gets started. Where is his character going? You daydream over it, and then you find out where they're going and what they want. If you know those two things, you know enough to write the story. Whenever anyone asks me where ideas come from, I always want to say a post box in Poughkeepsie. But of course, Nancy lives in Poughkeepsie, and maybe she knows where that post box is. She is the one author I know, maybe I know two others uh, in the entire universe, who are their work who are as, um, it's as if she's a tree and the leaves are her work. She just grows her work. We are in the backyard, and this is a good place to work for me, because if I spill anything, I can take the garden hose and clean it up immediately. And I have here the odds and ends, and they really are Pretty odd, odds and ends that I use in, in making things. Paws, teeth, shoes for all of the creatures. Those are the big size, and these are the smaller ones. There's even a few legs, running figures. Bones, whiskers. A lot of the bones that come from fish, things from the sea. Those are turkey bones. I can see, sometimes you can see it as eyes or a window of some odd structure somebody looking through. So you really sort of play with them until you see what you can do. These were just some pods that have the most wonderful silken texture. They are going to be somebody's ears. I don't know who, but they will be somebody's. I read old, old legends and stories about um, the, the moon is an egg, and it's carried by a bird. So maybe this bird will carry that, carry that story. I'll probably put it in here, which means I have to put a face on it. I may make it half dark and half light. The inside of this is going to be night colored, and the outside is going to be um, maybe the color of the end of the day, which this reminds me of that color. The salmon. I think it would be boring if it was all just straight blue. I like to mix it. All right, it's the color I always like to try to get. It's very hard. It's the color at the end of the day. There's always a green ray. Sunset. So I would imagine this as being a lot of the colors from the day. You've got sun, you've got grass, you've got all those kinds of light. So when you go into here, it's very different. It suddenly becomes very quiet. But sometimes you can make the other color show through underneath, which I like. This is one of the lobsters' tail. I think that's all part of the same. A bunch of bones and scales and pieces that I was putting together. It's 
it's a little like doodling, I think. Where you really think what it really when you're freeing up your mind, what that really means is that you are um, you're looking at all possibilities. You haven't and you nothing you don't say to yourself at any point, this doesn't make sense. This can't this isn't gonna work. You just watch what happens. You run it through your head. He's a bird carrying the moon. There is certainly some story there, though I think it's a story that probably many people have told in folk tales. That one, but I would like to make him a magic bird. Table for two, the son inquired. We chose a lovely green one till I slapped my broth on the tablecloth and the snow threw down a clean one. Well, my favorite book for children of Nancy Willard's is the High Rise Glorious Skittle Scat Rorious Sky Pie Angel Food Cake. And it has several of Nancy Willard's key themes. It has family, which is very important, tradition, which is extremely important in Nancy Willard's writing, love, and angels. This, believe it or not, is an old toaster. It was my grandmother's toaster, and uh, I think it was a disaster as a toaster. It's much better as an odd object. I love anything with doors and things that are hidden away. It makes like a little theater again. So I decorated it with the rabbits running across the top, and of course the bread, to reference the fact that it was a toaster. It's, I like things that are winged. It could take flight at any time, and there is an angel on the front. And again, the baker's chocolate lady, she's in a lot of the f things that I make, because I always love that image. And I suppose it comes from seeing it in the kitchen cupboard when I was a little girl crawling around the floor, um, looking at all eye level with the things in the, in the, in the cupboard and looking at the pictures on the canned goods and on the cocoa can and all the things that were down there. And I was always interested in where was she going? Who was she? Who was getting this tray of, I think she's carrying some cocoa on the tray. Um, I used to wonder what name she had. So she figures a lot and she's in, I think she's on the other side of the piece too. But then I've given her some wings, sort of a heavenly messenger delivering something very good to somebody who needs it. I think the world is different in Nancy's eyes. I think the world, when passed by Nancy, changes somehow. She sees details in the world that the rest of us pass by, where she makes connections that the rest of us don't see. There is a great, a great, a dog's head with open mouth. <laughs> this is, or a snake's head, maybe. Look at that. It's a, even has the eyes in the right place. The eye over here and the eye over here. That would be a nice head for something. I'll hang on to that one. There's great textures on these. But Nancy lives in the world of ideas. They're there. I mean, they're almost, you can see them perching on her shoulders. The rest of us have to work a little harder at it, I think. I've always loved the Statue of Liberty because it meant a lot um, to our family, at least to my grandmother's family. Her parents came through Ellis Island. So I heard a lot about that experience, about what it was like to be an immigrant, and I certainly knew that this meant something to them. The real Statue of Liberty, of course, is dressed in a toga. So I thought the Statue of Liberty has a lot of people to take care of. She should be properly dressed for this task. So I made it in working clothes. One of the th things, when I, one of the things I loved about the Statue of Liberty was the, the inscription at the base, the little piece of the poem. I lift my lamp beside the golden door, and it was the golden door that fascinated me. And who could had the power to do that, to open that door? So she's not holding the plaque; she's holding the passport to America, which is meaningful to um, anybody who comes from immigrant background. The moon's report on the stubborn stove. 
Our stove has become very strange. It cannot abide any change. When I make the French toast, it smells strongly of roast, and the burners play home on the range. The one time I really tried to plan a story, I outlined it. But I, and when I went to bed, I had a slightly sinking feeling that I didn't have it right and didn't know what to do. But I had a dream that night in which the character of the story came and said, let me tell you what really happened, how to tell that story. And the character told me the whole story over again, the right way to tell it. And I threw out the outline. I wrote what, what I had learned in the dream. If you're looking for it, you will find it. And that's also true in other disciplines, too. My father was a scientist. And he would work on a chemistry problem, because he was a chemist. And at bedtime, he'd say, I give up. And in the middle of the night, I'd hear him get up and write down the solution. He always counted on that. So he would go as far as he knew, and then he would wait to find out what the rest of the answer was. When I was three years old, I had a dream. In the dream, I fell asleep and woke up and looked out of the window and saw a ring of animals walking around the house. They were animals that you'd find up in the northern woods. There were moose and otter, and um, nothing as exotic as tigers. Nothing like that, Nothing, no elephants, no circus animals. They were walking in what I thought was a magic circle around the house. So in the dream, when I woke up, I climbed out of the window and climbed up on the back of the biggest animal. I think it was a moose or a deer. And we went off into the woods. And then my mother came in and woke me up. So I never found out where we were going. And I wanted to write it down. But at three years old, of course, I couldn't write. I think when I was in second grade, I knew enough letters so that I could write, write that down. And so that was maybe one of the first things I've ever I wrote. And um, for me, there's always a strong connection between dreaming and writing. My name is Shoe Fly Sally, sir. I've traveled far and wide. My box of biscuits on my back, my hound dog at my side. My shoe fly pie is much admired from Fairbanks to Bombay. I learned to bake from a talking cake at the Sunnyside Cafe. It's there the gypsy pancakes shout when the chicken sucks its thumb. The kettle sneeze, the teaspoons tease, the soporific sun, till it falls asleep in a field of sheep and the great bear starts to roar. Let the moon in Riddle's diner, sir, throw wide its silver door. It's here the hoppopopples dance and the emerald antelopes sing. My dog's as welcome as myself. His name is everything. The conductors ask us where we're bound and wait for me to say, the Moon and Riddle's Diner, sir, and the Sunnyside Cafe. Sally, go round the sun. Sally, go round the moon. Sally, go around the chimney pots on a Saturday afternoon. My name is Shoe Fly Sally, sir. I've traveled far and wide. My box of biscuits on my back. My hound dog at my side. My Shoe Fly Pie is much admired from Fairbanks to Bombay. I learned to bake from a talking cake at the Sunnyside Cafe. It's there the gypsy pancakes shout when the chicken sucks its thumb. The kettles sneeze, the teaspoons tease, the soft bowl sun. Let the moon and riddles 
dinosaur The whitest silver door It's here the Papa Popples dance And the emerald antelope sing My dog's as welcome as myself His name is everything Conductors ask us where we're bound And wait for me to say The moon and riddles dinosaur And the sunny side cafe The train I took to Buffalo was 20 hours late when the Buffalo King began to sing his voice was a squeaky gate he asked me when 